Well, the most high be praised this evening. We bless the Almighty for his great grace, his mercies, and his kindness toward us today. We praise him for another midweek time of teaching. And we want to say shalom to each and every one of you. We want to say shalom to all of you who are watching us by live stream. And we greet you in the mighty name of Yahshua, our King. And trust that you have had a blessed week thus far. We've had some challenges here in the Washington area. Uh, just got back in uh, a few days ago and came back to find that there were some wildfires here in our region. And so right now uh, there's power outages and there's evacuations and a number of things going on. But the Most High is still on the throne. And he's still working in the lives of his people. He is still preserving his people. He is still delivering on the behalf of his people. And so I'm grateful to know that that is true. A gentleman that I was speaking with was telling me about a friend of his who was a believer that when the fires came that uh, they had burned up the properties uh, that were right by his home, but didn't touch his. And he said that had to be the Most High. And we know that it is the Most High. And we thank the Almighty that when tragedy comes, whether it's natural disaster, whether it's wars, famines, whatever it may be, the scriptures teach us that the Almighty will preserve his people that he will take care of them and keep them safe. Does that mean that uh, destruction will never hit the believer? No. But regardless of who may suffer from things that may happen, we have a word of promise about what our Elohim will do for us if we trust him. And if we continue to put our faith in him, he is mindful of us and he is concerned about the things that go on in our lives. So I want to encourage us today to continue to believe Elohim and learn to trust him. Today I want to share on a topic that's called Yahshua the firstborn, and the creator. And I'm sharing this from what's noted in the writings of the Apostle Paul in a small letter that he wrote to the Messianic Israelite community in Colossae called Colossians. And for those of you who have your Bibles, if you would open up, I want you to go there, chapter 1. I'm going to begin at verse 12, and I'm going to read through to verse 17. And after I read this, um, I want to take some time to elaborate on what is revealed in these statements that the Apostle Paul makes that I believe will help us to maybe understand our Messiah a little bit better. Hallelujah. So that we might understand how significant he really is when it comes to the plan of the Father and the plan that has been set in motion from the foundations of the world. So let's go to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to begin at verse 12 and read through to verse 17. And today I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. 
as I'm reading this, I find that um, this particular version tends to, uh, at least in the scripture text, mind you, uh, in this particular scripture text, this version uh, tends to line up quite well with the original Greek text and its rendering. And so I want to read this because it uh, is a bit more accurate than the King James Version. Hallelujah. So, let's go to verse 12 of chapter 1 of Colossians. And it says, Giving thanks to the Father who has enabled us or has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins through his blood. He is the image of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of all creation. For in him or by him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He is, he himself is, before all things, and in him, or by him, all things hold together. Abba Yah, thank you today for this opportunity to take time to share these verses of Scripture. And I ask that you would give me insight and revelation knowledge by your Ruach to communicate this information with clarity today. I ask that you would give your people, those who are listening, an ear to hear and a heart to receive. May they be open to the truth that is presented and how the writer of this letter desire to present our Messiah. I ask that you would be glorified in everything accomplished and that we might know our Messiah, Yahshua, in a more excellent way. We thank you in Yahshua's great name. Amen. Now, in Reading this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the people of Elohim here in Colossae. As with all of his letters, he writes to encourage and to strengthen the Messianic Israelite community. To help them to grow in their faith, in their knowledge of Elohim the Father, and in their knowledge of our Messiah, Yahshua. As Paul is writing and introducing uh, himself and stating what he desires the believers to know and what he desires for them to have and what he desires for them to experience in Elohim. 
He reveals some things about our Messiah that a lot of times are missed. And what I want to do is just to take some time and go through these verses and help to point out some very uh, important things that help us to understand that our Yahshua is more than just the Savior of the world. That he is more than just the one who died and was buried and rose again. So oftentimes, the average believer only sees Yahshua as the one who died for their sins and who is coming again. But when we look at what these scriptures begin to reveal about our Messiah, we find that there is more to him than meets the eye. So, in verse 12, as Paul is talking to the people and telling them about how they need to be strong and that there is power that Elohim has given to, to them that comes from his glory. He says that you are to give thanks to the Father. When you're going through temptation, give thanks to the Father who has enabled you, he talks about what the Father has done now, he says, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the set-apart people in light. So he talks about this inheritance of the saints. He talks about an inheritance of the holy people. The term saint it just is another word for holy people, set apart people. So he says that the Father has enabled us or has put us in a position to share in the inheritance of the sanctified. There is a people in the earth that Elohim has set apart for himself because they responded to the message of the kingdom. They perform teshiva, they, they return to Elohim, they repented, which is the word commonly used, and they believed on Yahshua to be the Messiah, and they were brought into a place of set-apartness, separated from the world, and are made to be the sanctified, the holy people, the set-apart people of the Most High. So the Father has caused all of this to be, it says. And as Paul is continuing to talk about what the Father has done, Ha'aba, he is the Father because he is the strong one of the house and he is the one from which all things proceed. In other words, he is the source from which all things proceed. And so it says that he has rescued us from the power of darkness and has transferred us some translations would say has translated us, he has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son or his beloved son. So he's brought us into a position 
of being a set-apart people in the light. And Paul uses this term light because he is about to make a contrast in the next statement, which we've already read, a contrast of showing that we have been taken out of the darkness. We have been delivered from the power of darkness. We have been rescued from the power of darkness or the kingdom of darkness and have been transferred into the kingdom of his son, which is the kingdom of light. So the father is the source of deliverance. He is the source of the salvation. He is the source of of rescuing us and bringing us into the kingdom of his son, according to the writing here of this letter. But then it begins to talk about the son. The son. The father transfers us from darkness and puts us into the kingdom of his son. So the kingdom of Elohim, which has commonly been referred to as such, belongs to his son, his son being Yahshua. And what's interesting about this is that the son whom we have been brought into his kingdom, or whose kingdom we have been brought into, is also the one who has provided the redemption. So when we look at verse 14, it tells us, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we are told that in the Messiah, in Yahshua, in his Son, we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. So now Paul shifts from talking about what the Father has done to now beginning to describe what the Son has done. So we find that the Father is the source of our salvation. He is the source of us being rescued from the power of darkness. But there is a way or there is a vehicle by which the Father has chosen to perform this rescue or this salvation. See, here is where we begin to talk about the manner in which the Father chose to bring redemption and salvation for the human race. But before man had sinned, before man was even created, before the Ha'olam was created, that's the Hebrew term for the universe or the world, before there was a sun and a moon fixed in the heavens, before there were stars hung in the heavens, there was something that happened. And this something that happened, it's not always discussed because we tend to think of Elohim in terms of, as we read in Genesis, that he created everything. But not much is said about how he created everything. <laughs> we read in Genesis, it says, and Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And then it talks about what Elohim did on the first day all the way through to the Sabbath. But when we look in the scriptures, we find other details about the channel through which 
Elohim created. There's passages in the Psalms where it says that Elohim, by wisdom, created everything. And in this passage here, we find some interesting information about Yahshua. Most of us, we refer to him as being the son of Elohim. Messiah said that uh, I've come to do the will of my father who sent me. Yahshua talked about the glory that he had when he was with the father. But here, when we look at the 15th verse, we find something interesting. Because in verse 15, it, it says that Yahshua is the image of the invisible Elohim. So we find that he is the image or the picture of the invisible Elohim. He's the image with respect to us who live on the earth. He is the image of the invisible Elohim the firstborn of all creation. Now this phrase right here, the firstborn of all creation, is probably going to throw some of us for a loop. First time I ever read this some years ago, it threw me for a loop. You know, as a new believer many years ago, I used to read through Colossians, and I would just kind of breeze over this part. I'm reading, and it says, oh, he's the image of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of all creation, and, and then I just keep reading. But I didn't stop to take a moment to breathe and to examine what this actually says. He is the firstborn of all creation. That means that of everything that has been made, of everything that has been produced and has been created, Yahshua is the firstborn. Now, what is this saying? Is this talking about Yahshua being born from Mary? Based upon what this scripture is saying, it's not talking about him being born from Mary. Because Based upon what we're reading here and what we continue to read in these passages, it tells us that he was before all things. So we know that this is not referring to him being born from Mary's womb. He pre-existed everything. When it talks about that he is the firstborn of all creation, it is saying that he is the first that came forth from the essence of the Father. Now, I know that with me saying that, there are some people who are probably saying, that's false doctrine, um, that's not according to the Nicene Creed. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not a follower of the Nicene Creed. I'm not, a, I'm not a follower of what Constantine and what those uh, Western church fathers um, came up with um, during that time. I'm, I, I'm not uh, one who follows that. I, I only follow the scriptures. And what I see in the scriptures reveals, especially when we look at Proverbs chapter 8, Go back and you read Proverbs chapter 8. You'll notice that when wisdom is speaking, that wisdom says that Elohim possessed me. And it says that before the earth was, before the mountains were created, before he set boundaries for the waters, he says, or wisdom says, I was brought forth. In other words, I was born. So we find that wisdom 
was brought forth from Yahuwah. In other words, wisdom came out from the very essence of Elohim specifically for the purpose of creating everything. Now you say, wow, I, that's hard for me to embrace. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to throw some weird philosophy on anybody. I'm just sharing what the scripture says. You can read this scripture here. It says that Yahshua is the firstborn of all creation. In Proverbs, it talks about wisdom being brought forth before everything was made. In Psalms, it talks about that Elohim, or Yahuwah, by wisdom, or through wisdom, created everything. And in passages in the writings of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he speaks about Messiah, he also says this about Messiah, that Yahshua is the wisdom and the power of Elohim. Another place where we could go that adds some support to this is when you read over in John chapter 1, verse 1. And most people are familiar with that verse. And that verse says that in the beginning, now when the Bible talks about the beginning, it's not talking about the beginning of Elohim because Elohim doesn't have a beginning. But it's talking about the beginning of of creation. So it says, in the beginning was the word. The Greek term used is logos. The term logos is a term from a Greek perspective is synonymous with the wisdom and the reality of all things. So that word is what's used as a way of describing, listen now, as a way of describing the Hebraic understanding of the wisdom. It says in the beginning was the logos, or the wisdom and reality of all things. And this wisdom and reality of all things, listen to me now, was with Elohim. And this wisdom and reality was Elohim. And then John continues in his writing. You can go read it in the first chapter of John. First verse. And it says, regarding this Logos, it says, all things were made by him and that there was nothing made that was made. So what that is doing is giving support and confirmation to what was written in Proverbs chapter 8 when it talks about wisdom being brought forth. So here over in Colossians, as Paul is describing the Messiah, because it's clear to me in understanding the thinking of these apostles in that era, in how they saw and understood Yahshua, and how they understood the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and they knew that already had a knowledge that there was this there was this thing, or I'll say things called the Sephirot of Elohim. These are emanations or manifestations, that's the only way that they could describe it because of how the scriptures presented wisdom and power and how they were given personage in describing their activity and work in creation. And so when Yahshua came, the apostle John, Yochanan, the apostle Paul, in understanding the person of Yahshua, knew that Yahshua was that manifestation that came forth from the very essence of Elohim and took on personage, the wisdom of Elohim. It says that he was the firstborn 
He was the firstborn. That's why the Bible says that Yahshua is the only begotten of the Father. The only begotten of the Father. See? See, Scripture says that what? That Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He is the only begotten. Now, why is he called the only begotten son? Because in other passages of the scriptures, the Most High says in regards to Israel, he says, Israel is my son. But wait a minute. How could Yahshua be the only begotten, all right, when he says that Israel is his son? How can he be the only begotten? What's the difference? The difference is that Yahshua is the only one that came right out of the essence of Elohim. Whereas with us, we were created from the elements of the Haaretz, the elements, the dust of the ground. We were created from that and were called Benin or children of Elohim. That is the difference. But here, as Paul describes Yahshua, he says that he is the firstborn of all creation. Now look at what happens here. And, I, and I'm, I'm sharing this slowly because I want us to see the consistency in connection with what has been written in Proverbs 8 and also in the Psalms, where Psalms talks about that Yahuwah, by wisdom, created everything. I want us to see the consistency, how all this ties into Yahshua. And so, we're told that he is the firstborn of all creation. Scripture says it. That settles. He came right out of the essence of the Father. All right? And then it says, for in him, still talking about Yahshua, still talking about the firstborn of all creation, in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created. Now, this is powerful because what we see is that whereas Yahuwah Elohim is the source, in other words, he's the originator of all things, an aspect of his being, he pushed forth out of him, brought forth. I know this sounds strange, but this is the only way that I can explain it. Through wisdom, Yahuwah, through the firstborn, all right, the pre-existent Yahshua created all things in the heavens. That means that all of the Malachim, the angels were created by him. That means the heavens were created by him. That means the earth was created by him. The Ha'olam, everything, the visible things and the invisible things were all created by Yahshua. Now, yes, all things are created by Elohim. But it is through Yahshua that all things have been created. So when we talk about who created us, when we talk about <laughs> when we talk about whose image we are made in, <laughs> when we talk about that, you see. We, we've been created in the image of Elohim, but it 
it, it is that that wisdom of Elohim. It is the firstborn, the one that came forth out of the essence of Elohim. It, it is Yahshua who created everything. <laughs> no wonder why he is called everlasting father. When you read over in Isaiah, and Isaiah talks about him, Talks about. Matter of fact, let's go to Isaiah. I'm trying to help us to understand some things so that the scriptures that we read make sense. Because some things we read in the scriptures, and it's like, man, this just this is just not making sense. I don't get it. <laughs> that's why. That's why David could could prophesy, and he could say that. Yahuwah said to Adoni, or my master, my Lord, the one over me, sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David had a revelation. He had an understanding that there was a son. He had a revelation. He had an understanding. And he knew that the son was his master, his creator. While yet the father is the source of all creation, he created all things through the son. Now I know that that sounds kind of philosophical, but I'm just trying to explain it to us the best way I possibly can. That's all I'm trying to do, just to help us to understand so Isaiah chapter 9, I just want to add some support by using uh, a verse here. Check this out. Let's listen, listen to what this says. Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going to start from verse uh, 6, but, you know, I really would love to read it all the way through, but that's just going to take a little time because when you start at the first verse of chapter 9 of Isaiah, it's all prophetic, talking about how that it's going to be in Zebulon, in the land of Naphtali, in the regions beyond the Jordan, of the Galilee of the nations, it talks about they're going to see light. You know, it's speaking with reference to the fact that the Messiah would come through that region. All of this is prophetic. But let me go to verse 6, because in verse 6 it says, For unto us a child is born. So this is talking about prophetically the Messiah as a child being birthed from Mary. It says, for a child has been born for us, or unto us a child is born, a son is given. And it says, and the authority will rest upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty L, Everlasting Father. Hold up. Now, I mentioned, right? He's given this name Everlasting Father. Why? Why is he given the name Everlasting Father? Because through him everything was created, even us. We were all created by Yahshua. It was through Yahshua that all things have been created. Now this is just nothing but the sovereign choice of Yahuwah the Father to produce everything that exists. He chose to do it that way. Okay? He chose to do it through his son, who also is called the Devar Elohim, the Word, the Devar Elohim. The term Devar Elohim is, 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 is a powerful word in meaning itself. It's very powerful. You know, we translate it as being word in the sense of a word spoken, but it's much more than that. <laughs> much more than that. And um, when we understand the fullness of who he is and the preeminence of his person, 
Now, mind you, <laughs> he himself said, while saying that he and the Father are echad, he is delivering everything back to the Father. So he himself considers himself subject to the Father. This is just the way that Yahuwah chose to manifest himself and to create all things through his Son, who is called the Word of Elohim. I hope this is not confusing anybody, but I'm just trying to help us to understand that Yahshua created everything. And the reason why he is called Everlasting Father is because it is through him that the life that we have, all right, it is through him that the life we have is maintained and will continue in this age and in the one to come. He is the one that created all things. He is called Everlasting Father. He is not the Father, but he is the Father of eternity. He is the Father of life, everlasting life that has been made available for us. That's why the scripture says that he is the one that can give life to whoever he chooses. All right, let's go back to Colossians. So we see in Colossians it says that all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, are created by him. It even talks about whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. That means that every governmental system that exists and that will exist has been given their authority from him. Listen, it says whether there be thrones, dominions, rulers, or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. In other words, all things, everything, has been created through him and for him, which means that the Father has chosen to put all things in the hands of his Son. All right? He has chosen to give him charge over creation, and over all of the things that operate in the earth realm and in the heavens. Notice what it says in verse 17. He himself is before all things. So we know that he was before all things. We know he preexisted, right? And in him all things are held together. So everything that exists, every system, every uh, dynamic, you know, in college I took three courses of physics. And, and I remember a course called Statics, that has to do with things that stay still and being able to learn how to calculate forces on objects that are at rest. And then there was also a part of physics that was called dynamics, which has to do with objects in motion. And this particular science it taught us how to understand how things operate in the universe. Well, this is man's way of being able to understand how things operate in the universe. And you have a lot of systems out there in the universe that men have given names to to describe how they understand 
the creation of Elohim. But all of these systems in the universe, everything that operates, all of it is held together by Yahshua. He holds all things together. He not only created everything, but he holds all things together. Isn't that something? So Yahshua is more than just our Savior. He is more than just our risen Lord. He is our creator. The Father, through Yahshua, all right, created everything. But the instrumentality, if I can use that term, if I can use that term, the manifest instrument, the manifest person, his son created everything. And see, rooted in the truth of Yahshua being our creator, rooted in the truth of Yahshua being our Redeemer. When the Bible says that there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved but by the name of Yahshua, it is because Yahshua is more than just the one who died for our sins. He's more than just a propitiation. You see. There's some who will venture to say that well you know the only thing that Yahshua came to do was to die for our sins and that's it. And that there is no more or that there is a uh, no other significant role that he has. But what we fail to realize is that the Father in his divine sovereignty gave the authority or channeled, however we want to call it or describe it, he gave Yahshua the responsibility of creating the Haolam. That's all I know. And because of this truth, him having the authority to create everything, everything, every demon, every authority in the earth realm, Every human being, every system, the waters, the winds, the waves. That's why when Yahshua was here, all he had to do was say, Shalom, be still to the winds and the waves. And they stood still because it was their creator that was telling them to stay still. That's why when demons saw him, they said, have you come to torment us before the time? Why? Because they knew he was the creator. Come on. I'm trying to help us to understand Yahshua in a larger light. Now I know some of our brothers who are regarded as oneness Pentecostals, they will venture to say that Yahshua is the Father. But the scriptures 
reveal something a little different about how Elohim brought about or orchestrated the way in which he would create everything. Now, we're not coming up with some new doctrine because many of the church fathers that lived right before the Nicene Creed believed this that I'm sharing. I'm not sharing something that's new. I'm not sharing something that's out of the box somewhere. Go read Eusebius. For anybody who know Eusebius, he was one of the major historians during the time of the 4th century. Go read his writings. He was one who believed that Yahshua was brought forth from the Father. All right? And created all things. So I'm not, I'm not sharing something that's weird and out the box anywhere. It sounds strange to some people because, you know, the Western Christian uh, world anchors its belief system on the councils that developed, the first being the Council of Nicaea and the other councils that came after it and in their classic doctrine of the Trinity. Now, some might say, oh, you don't believe in the Trinity? Well, I don't believe in the Trinity the way they they said it, but I believe that there is a composite oneness to Elohim. I believe that there is an existing plurality in the one Elohim. And that's the only way I can describe it and say it. But what the scriptures reveals is that Yahshua is the firstborn. And not only is he, is he the firstborn, but he is also the creator. He created us. And because he did, because he did, he is the one with sovereign authority and complete power over all of creation. And the Father has given him, notice, after he died and rose, he said to his apostles over in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, I believe it is. I believe it starts over in the, let me go to it so, so I can make sure I'm not um, quoting it out of turn. Let me, let me go to it. Actually, in verse 18, it says, And Yahshua came and said to them, All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. So after he rose, all authority has been given to him. Now, before he came into the earth realm, he already had all the authority. But he left that authority there in the heavens. And when he took upon himself flesh and was born through Miriam, and after his death and resurrection, then he took his glory back. And when he took his glory back, he came and showed up to the apostles and said, All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. So guess what happens now when we begin to see Yahshua in this preeminent position? When we begin to see him more than just our Savior. When we begin to see him more than just our resurrected King. You see, the reason why we can use his name, the reason why every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess is not just because he rose from the dead. Even though that's a part of the plan, that's a part of the process, that's, that's a part of what had to occur to secure our redemption. He had to rise from the dead to secure our redemption. All right? That had to take place. Why did that have to take place? Hmm? Why? Because 
when he rose from the dead, he went into the heavenlies before the Father with his own blood to become the high priest, to take his blood, to sprinkle it on the mercy seat seven times, to complete the work of atonement for the entire world. The sins of every human being, past sin, present sin, and future sins. He had to get up from the grave and to complete the work of redemption for us. So the resurrection was necessary. He couldn't stay in the grave. He still had to perform a, a priestly work. But the point that I'm trying to make here today has to do with the fact that because he is the creator, because he has already been in the preeminent position of being the creator, the creator of us, all right, came into our realm, died, rose, became our high priest, restored us back to fellowship with the Father. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. So when people come along and they try to minimize the person of Yahshua, they say, oh, he was just a powerful prophet. You know, like, you know, my, my Muslim brothers, you know, they, 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 they refer to Yahshua as being a powerful prophet who spoke the words of Elohim. And, and by the way, y'all, all right, you know, some of y'all think that Muslims hate Yahshua. Muslims don't hate Yahshua. They have a great respect for Yahshua. So when you're talking to them, don't view them as being those who hate Yahshua. They have a great respect for Yahshua. Now those who hate Yahshua are unbelieving Judeans, such as those who practice rabbinic Judaism. They hate Yahshua. Alright? They're the ones who hate Yahshua. If you read in their Talmud, their Talmud has a great deal of very negative and nasty statements about Yahshua. Stuff like he should be boiled in excrement. Now that's, I'm just going to leave it there. But there again, we pray for them that they may turn to Yahshua and be saved. Because whereas they venture to keep Torah based upon the religious tradition that has been handed down to them through their sages in the Talmud, in the Mishnah. Yet because they reject Yahshua, who is the creator of us all, they will lose out. Now, mind you, I believe in keeping Torah just like anybody else that believes in keeping Torah because it is important to the Father. It is. But the bottom line is that there is no name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved, but by the name of Yahshua. That's the only name. If you're going to enter in, you got to come through him. Because Yahweh, through wisdom, created us all. And that wisdom is Yahshua, our king. I trust that this teaching has helped to shed some light today. And that it has opened up our eyes to be able to understand our Messiah on a greater level. Because not only is he our Savior, not only is he the firstborn from creation or before creation, but he is also 
our creator. And through him, everything is held together. I'm going to close on that note. Let us pray. Abba Yah, thank you so much for this opportunity to share these scriptures today. And I hope that this teaching has brought some enlightenment to your disciples and to those who have taken the time to listen in and to hear what we're talking about as we elevate and lift up the mighty name of Yahshua, our King. I trust, Father, that it has caused people to begin to rethink their theology, to rethink their way of seeing our Messiah, and that they would allow themselves to be able to embrace this truth, to understand the connection, and be able to see that our Messiah, Yahshua, our Creator, His name is what stands above the whole creation and that we can use that name in operating great power. And by His name, deliverance can come. By His name, Miracles can be manifested. By his name, people can go from darkness into light. They can have a change. Through his name, there's redemption. And so I will y'all touch hearts, touch lives, touch minds. May each hearer have an open spirit and begin the journey of seeking you through Yahshua, our King. I thank you in the mighty name of Yahshua. Amen. I trust that this teaching has been a blessing to each one of you today and that it has been presented in a way that has been understandable to each one of you. It's our goal to help bring illumination to the scriptures and to hopefully help explain some things in the Bible that seem to be a bit confusing. Because the Father, I believe, wants us to have clarity in our understanding of his ways and also of the message that he has given to us. For those who are watching us for the first time, I'd like to invite you to go to our website, at www.ncmmi.20m.com and you can view the materials that we have there. Please go to our link called the Written Word Library. We have a number of written articles there that I believe will be of great benefit to each one of you to be of biblical enrichment and encouragement in your walk. Well, we thank you for watching. We ask you to pray for us and that you would continue to watch us again. Gather with us by live stream on this Shabbat at 1230, at Saturday at 1230 p.m. and receive the word of Elohim. Thank you for watching. Shalom.